In this lecture, we'll discuss heterogeneous stream effects. The motivation for estimating heterogeneous effect is the fact that in many applications, the same exact treatment may affect different individuals in differently. To do this, we often estimate the conditional average stream effect, where the average stream effect is characterized as a function of x. x is the observed covariance. So we can, uh, we can know how the average stream effect changes depending on the characteristics of individuals. This addresses the question of whether uh, who benefits from and is harmed by the treatment on average. Now, once we estimate the conditional average stream effect, we might be also interested in constructing so-called individualized treatment rule, ITR. Individual treatment rule is a function that maps from the support of a distribution of observed characteristics x, that's the cardiac, to the recommendation of whether uh, someone should be treated or not, 0 or 1. Okay, so depending on your characteristics, the ITR will tell you whether you should receive the treatment or not. Note that we can never identify an individual causal effect. Uh, tau i, which is the difference between the two potential outcomes. And yet, since we only observe one of the two potential outcomes for any given individuals, there's no way of identifying this uh, individual causal effect. Okay. What, that mean, what, the, what that means is that the implication of this fact is that the ITR depends on the choice of x. The, the, depending on different, uh, if you have different covariates, different set of covariates x, then the ITR may give you different recommendations. Right? And you never know uh, whether one ITR's recommendation is better than another ITR recommendation um, for any particular individual. Okay? And, and more importantly, Depending on the set of covariates you use to construct ITR, you get different recommendations. It, it doesn't follow that, the, you know, the, the, just because you have more covariates doesn't necessarily mean that um, the ITR recommendation for any given individual is better than conditioning on fewer number of covariates. So that's a difficulty. The choice of X really determines what kind of ITR we get. In the uh, current literature, there's um, increased this sort of increasing use of machine learning methods to figure out how to estimate this conditional average treatment effect and uh, how to construct individual treatment rule. So we'll discuss some of the use of machine learning methods in this lecture. Before I go to um, the machine learning use of machine learning. Let's think about the simple subgroup analysis, um, the pre-registration. If you have a hypothesis, very specific hypothesis, about some group-specific effects, for example, you may hypothesize that particular treatment affects the men uh, positively, but the women negatively. If that's the case, you can simply stratify the data between men and women, for example, and estimate the average human effect within each strata. If it's an experimental study, you can just estimate the using the difference in means among the men and among the women, and then do a comparison. Right? You can compare the ATE between these groups. So there's nothing really wrong about doing that, um, and there's no fancy uh, statistical methods required to do this, to test these hypotheses. However, the potential problem is if you do this type of subgroup analysis over and over across different subgroups, you have the issue of multiple testing, uh, sometimes called the data snooping, right? Just choosing the, or p-hacking or fishing, the idea of choosing the subgroup analysis that um, fits your hypothesis, right? So there's some selection if you do conduct these um, subgroup analysis over and over across different subgroups. One solution to this type of problem is um, to pre-register hypothesis and analysis that you're going to conduct so that 
Um, you don't come up with these hypothesis and analysis post hoc after the after either conducting experiment uh, or in the case of observational studies, um, you know after seeing the data, figuring out uh, what to do and what hypothesis to test. So this is pretty standard in medicine and it has become a norm also in the social sciences. And there are repositories where you can pre-register your hypothesis and analysis of most, most, most often for experimental studies, but you can also do this for observational studies before you, have, you gain access to the data. Okay. So here, uh, there are a few uh, registries that where you can um, register your pre-register your hypothesis and analysis. Now, this is a good thing uh, in general, so that you will not construct a new hypothesis uh, by just after looking at the data and change your analysis, um, uh, so that uh, the you know the results that you obtain are favorable in terms of your hypothesis. However, so the pre-registration solves this sort of commitment problem. You commit to a particular set of hypotheses and the analysis and, uh, before you actually look at the data. Now, committing a certain type of analysis may not necessarily be a good thing because you might often um, find out some unexpected uh, features of the data once you see them, and you might want to adjust uh, your analysis after you've seen, say, the data had a lot more missing data than you expected, or uh, certain data points were outliers uh, in a way that you didn't expect. Okay, so when you see those unexpected features of the data, it might make sense to adjust your analysis accordingly. But pre-registering, nevertheless, the pre-registering hypothesis and analysis makes it clear that which hypothesis and which analysis were um, constructed after the seeing the data. So that for that for that transparency purposes, I think this is a really good thing. Okay. However, this system doesn't solve the statistical problem of multiple testing. And in order to address these uh, statistical problems, you have to use appropriate statistical methodology. So I'm not going into the detail of uh, such methodology, uh, you can, um, you know, there's a huge, big literature and you can look it up. Um, but for example, you might want to control family-wise error rate. So if you're doing the multiple testing, uh, testing multiple hypotheses, you might want to control family-wise error rate, which is a probability of making any type of uh, type one error. Okay? Not just the, each one hypothesis separately, but if you're conducting 10 hypothesis testing, what is the probability that making, you know, at least one type one error in one of the ten hypotheses? Another alternative that uh, that has become popular over the last uh, twenty years is a false discovery rate control. So this uh, type of statistical hypothesis test will control the expected proportion of type one error among all re all rejections of now hypothesis. So unlike the family-wise error rate, which focus on making any type one error, this one is a little bit uh, less stringent. So they try to control the expected proportion of type one error among all rejections you make. So if you suppose if you reject 10 null hypotheses, uh, what would be the uh, expected proportion of among 10 that you reject if all the null hypotheses are actually turned out to be true? Okay. So these uh, methods, there are, there are um, you know, many statistical hypothesis testing methodologies that tries to control false discovery rate and the family voids error rate so that you don't fall into this problem of multiple testing. Let's now shift the gear and discuss the use of machine learning for estimating heterogeneous causal effects. Why do we use machine learning for estimation of heterogeneous stream effects? Well, there are a couple motivations. First, we want to avoid the strong modeling assumptions. So um, modern machine learning methods um, allows you to estimate 
you know, the predict the um, uh, variables in a very flexible functional forms. So this is sort of thinking about data-driven approach. So instead of having a particular hypothesis, um, you, do, you try to use the data-driven approach to discover who is likely to be affected by the treatment most, um, either positively or negatively. Okay. At the same time, you also want to avoid false discoveries. So the, many of the machine learning methods allow you to avoid overfitting using some form of regularization. Now, there's a key difference between prediction and causality. Machine learning methods were mainly um, developed for the prediction purpose, and it's only uh, until recently that they have been started using for causality. The key difference is that for prediction, we're going to use observed covariance x to predict the outcome yi. Okay. However, for causality, what we want to do is we're going to use the same set of covariance xi but try to predict the potential outcome difference of the two potential outcomes, the causal effect. And as I said before, while yi, the outcome is observed, two potential outcomes are never observed at the same time. What that means is the individual causal effect, tau i, is never observed. So causality, using the machine learning for causal effects is much more difficult for doing the prediction because in the prediction, you're really trying to um, pin down the relationship between y and x. Whereas for causality, um, we are trying to pin down the relationship between the tau i and the xi, and yet tau, tau i is now observed, unlike the uh, prediction case where y i is observed for everybody. You can see this query by uh, looking at this mean square error decomposition. So in the first line, you see uh, the mean square error given the covariate value x between the, uh, for the estimating um, the individual causal effect tau i. Okay? And we have some estimator tau hat uh, of, uh, given the value of the covariance x. Okay? And we can uh, decompose this mean square error into two types of um, components. And you can see the first one tells you the, uh, the it's basically the variance of the um, individual causal effect among the people who have covariate value x. And the second one is the, uh, the mean square error of the Kate conditional average streaming effect function, tau of x. Okay. So inference of the heterogeneous streaming effects depends on these two things. So the first tells you how predictive xi is of tau i, the individual causal effect, how useful these covariates, observed covariates you chose to estimate the conditional of a treatment effect are about the individual treatment effect, right? Because this is the variance of the individual, um, the first term, right? This is the conditional variance of the individual treatment effect um, given the particular value of xi, right? So if you choose, um, very good uh, set of uh, observed covariates xi, then this variance should be small. That is, among the people who share the same characteristics, the treatment effect, individual treatment effect, shouldn't vary too much. Okay? So this is basically due to the choice of the covariate, uh, covariates x. The second part, second part is the how good your model is for estimating the condition of the treatment effect. So, this is basically the, uh, the mean square error of estimating the conditional average streaming effect. Okay. So the second part is, uh, is given x, how good is your model? The first part is how good is your choice of x, uh, choice of the covariates um, that you have uh, to estimate uh, uh, heterogeneous causal effect. 